Hello everyone, uh, my name is Holly Merton and I'm the Information Resource Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Rome and I'm very pleased, very pleased to finally have with us Dr. David Lankus from Syracuse University's iSchool here with us today for um, a video conversation. This conversation will be recorded and available um, on archived format on the U.S. Embassy in Rome's YouTube channel beginning tomorrow. Uh, I will send out the URL to everybody, um, your IROs and your embassies around the world um, after this uh, web chat is over. So if I could just give a, a few words of welcome to, to Dr. Lankus and a short introduction. He is a professor and a Dean Scholar for New Librarianship at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. He's also the director of the Information Institute of Syracuse. His book, The Atlas of New Librarianship, which has just been translated into Italian, and any other languages that you're aware of so far? It is currently being translated into Chinese. Oh, interesting. Mm. Wonderful. Um, it won the ABC Clio Green War, uh, Greenwood Award for the best book in library literature. He is a passionate advocate for librarians and um, their essential role in today's society. His current focus, is on reconceptualizing the library field through the lens of new librarianship. New librarians approach their work as facilitators of conversation, which is what we are doing today, hopefully. Um, be it in practice, policies, programs, and or tools, participatory librarians seek to enrich, capture, store, and disseminate the conversations of their communities. So thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I was hoping that the focus, that the main focus of today's conversation could be about library and information science in the United States. But if you could maybe um, lead that off by um, t telling us what um, a participatory librarian is <laughs> in your own words. Certainly. Um, it actually, what we're finding in all sorts of industry on technology and different platforms, but even in, in communities, is the importance of not simply serving a community, but being part of the community, particularly for libraries in university settings and public settings, um, government libraries, where it's not enough to say we have materials and a collection and people will come to us when they need them but really to understand that there is an amazing amount of expertise and understanding and knowledge and history and value in the people coming into the library and using our services. And so rather than us looking as uh, libraries and as librarians sitting apart from a community and serving them when they ask, really looking at uh, librarians as being part of the community, in the community, and in many ways providing the world access to the community and not the other way around. Can you give some examples of libraries you've seen that you think offer best practices? Sure. Um, there are examples that go from just, just the other day I was in Pistoia here in Italy, and uh, they've talked about the fact that they are the new community center. They have people who come into the library that are immigrants, people who come into the library that have been you know, seniors there for a long time. They have children coming in. And really it's one of the only places in the city that they can all congregate. And at the same time, they have 50 programs at a time, which can be everything from a story time where a librarian's reading mm -hmm. to a local tax expert coming in and talking about taxes mm -hmm. or a psychologist coming in and talking about mental health or medical experts. Mm -hmm. And that learning is coming from the community to the community. In, in New York uh, State, where I'm from, there's the Fayetteville Free Library. It's a relatively small suburban library, but um, they kept hearing the fact that there's a STEM education issue with women in the United States. We know that if you, if you ask girls in the early grades, are you interested in science and math? Yes, lots of them, 90% say we're part of it. And yet by the time they graduate high school, very few women say they're gonna go into the sciences. And so they looked and talked to the community and tried to think how they could be part of showing how science can be so, so interesting and, and bring women into the, into the profession, and they began a summer program. And rather than saying, you know, here's books on science and such, they brought in 
engineers who live in the community that talked about female engineers, what engineering is, and they built catapults in the library. So oh my you, gosh, yes, you'd, catapult. Be, you'd be walking through the stacks and suddenly pom poms would be flying over oh, your I head. Love it. They brought in a, a female fighter pilot from the Air Force oh, Reserve that's who talked about what it was to be a soldier, a mm -hmm. mother, and a pilot. And the great thing about this is when that week is over, those, that fighter pilot, that engineer, the girls that were also in there, they're your neighbors. Mm. So they're weaving this community together. You mm. see it in many different settings. Mm. You know, there are um, some libraries that I've run into um, in my travels that say, oh, we'd love to do that, but our communities do not have a tra tradition of volunteerism. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any suggestions on how they can um, overcome that? It's a very good question, and um, some libraries, for example, pay experts to come in for programming, and money can be very tight, particularly mm -hmm. these, these days. What we've found that's been most successful is at the libraries we've looked at, whether in North America or we've looked in Netherlands, we've looked in other places, is that the libraries offer these citizens, these neighbors, mm -hmm. these um, academics, et cetera, a different kind of payment, which is in reputation. Mm. Um, oh. it, there, it's not so much about volunteering as civic engagement. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so much about civic engagement as being seen by your community as an expert. Um, uh -huh. So there's a reputation a aspect yeah. that works very well. Mm. And the other thing is if librarians spend more time outside of their buildings and in the community, they're asking friends mm -hmm. to come over as opposed to strangers and mm -hmm. things. So it's creating relationships, building relationships. Many public libraries and academic libraries build strong relationships with local museums. And so they bring experts that may be different audiences mm -hmm. together. And uh, many governments have health outreach. They have different outreach programs. So they're bringing in people who already it's their job to share this information. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. Um, we did collect a number of questions from our um, potential audience, and one of them actually um, feeds into to what you were just saying. So I'll I'll jump um, I'll jump ahead to that. Uh, let's see, it was about dinosaurs. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's right. Librarians and information professionals uh, frequently want to expand and change the traditional concept of the bookish library, but they cannot because their administrators, their faculty, and their board members are dinosaurs. Mm. So what is the best way to convince these people to join the 21st century? <laughs> well, I found a couple of things that have been very helpful. Um, we, I've been pushing a theme called Expect More, and that is that... Mm. We need communities to expect more of our, their libraries, but we also need libraries and librarians to expect more of their communities. Um, that doesn't just mean financial support and tax support and space support. It means participation and, frankly, understanding that librarians have an expertise. And so when they want to push in a given direction, there's some respect that should go with that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's only built after a... a working with these folks and working with your mm. community over time so they begin to trust you. But the short answer is when you seek to include new services, many, unfortunately, library organizations look at fads. Oh, it's a 3D printer. Let's put mm. a 3D printer True. in. Oh, we're going to lend these things True. out. Oh, this is fancy. Have the answer to the question that the communities will always ask, which is, why is this a library? So I, I told the story, for example, of uh, bringing in um, psychologists and bringing in tax experts and bringing in doctors and bringing in these people and having conversations, as well as the collections. And the question I often get is, okay, 3D printing and therapy and doctors and lectures, why is this a library? Exactly. Isn't this a community center? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My first answer is, what's wrong with being the center of your community? But uh, what they really mean is, you know, once again, this could happen in any space. Why a library? Aren't you the book people? And the short answer that, that I often like to give is we're, because the librarian is there doing their job. So what is the job that that librarian's doing? They're doing collection development, mm. right? So we feel perfectly fine if a librarian says, we need these materials, we need this book, we need this database, mm. we need this sort of a trust that they went and they looked at and they vetted it, and that's not weird. And yet, the same thing's happening. If you come in to me and you say, mm. I'm an expert gardener, I would love to do a session on gardening. 
how do I know you know something about gardening? <laughs> or you maybe know a lot about gardening, but maybe your speaking skills aren't that great. I like to eat the things that come out of the there garden. There you go. Very <laughs> good. Very good. And so a librarian is there to say, is this going to be quality information? Mm -hmm. Is it going to match my community? Maybe you need skills. So maybe you're not an excellent speaker. You are. But I'm going to connect you with someone who is an excellent speaker, and we're going to work on developing those skills and suddenly a new connection, a new friendship. That's collection development. Mm -hmm. for, for, for centuries, we've looked at librarians and assumed that they have the ability to look at what a community is producing in, in its knowledge, primarily through the written record, but mm -hmm. producing through knowledge. Select what's most important and important to our communities. Acquire that. Organize it. Right? This is all very old school. And, and then provide access to it. Mm. Well, now what we're saying is besides doing that with our books and our materials and our databases, we're doing that with our doctors and our lawyers and our parents and our children and our videographers. Mm -hmm. And they're just part of that collection. And so it's the next step. You know, we love to read. And reading mm -hmm. is very important. But oftentimes, that, wouldn't you love to talk to the author as well? And so that's just an extension of mm -hmm. that collection. So by making them comfortable with it's still a, we still have a collection. There's still an important role for literacy and what you need. But ultimately, we're looking at taking our mission and modernizing it, but still with the same values, the same tradition, the same commitment mm -hmm. to community. I find that that really, people buy into that. They understand that, mm -hmm. um, no matter how traditional their view is. <laughs> you, um, you said something this morning that... Um, that I really liked to the extent that, that I wrote it down. <laughs> and um, you said that the mission of libraries is to improve societies through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities, mm -hmm. which is an extension of what you were just talking about. But then you took apart that mission statement and, um, and expanded on that a little. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to take it maybe um, a step further. Mm -hmm. And if the mission of libraries is to improve um, their societies through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities, how are how is library and information science education, list education, how are they serving this mission mm. now? So a uh, minor correction, oh, but not sorry. such a minor correction. The mission of librarians ah, is to improve society that's true. through... Um, that's, you've made a great point this morning about the difference between libraries and yeah, librarians. Yeah. So. We, ha we have no libraries watching us now because <laughs> libraries have bricks and mortar and not eyes. Um, so librarians. <laughs> And, but that's, a, that's actually an important distinction because for a very long time, we like to put up our institutions and, and say, and it's almost hide behind the institutions. You know, mm. oh, the library's doing this and the library's doing mm. that. And if, so, if something goes wrong, it's the library's fault. And if we want to have true value and connection to our communities, we have to be people. We have to, you know, it has to be a connection with me and a connection with the individuals. And so it's about librarians. The other important part of that is, while I feel there's a common mission of librarians, whether they're in Italy or whether they're in um, Greece or whether they're in Africa or the South America or what have you, mm -hmm. every library should have its own mission because a mm -hmm. library is owned by its community. And each community will have its own needs, its own unique perspective, its own understanding. So for some libraries and academic institutions, that mission may be about accelerating scholarship. In some libraries, it might be economic development or cultural heritage or whatever it is. So mm. libraries should be very unique. As librarians, mm. we should be able to talk across all of those communities and find out what works and then apply it. Okay. So, um, so that's one, one differentiator I would give you. The question then becomes, how do we prepare mm. librarians exactly. to do that? And, and there is an uncomfortable nature to what we're talking about, which is we're pushing librarians in front of the stacks. For a very long time, we've, um, the philosophy could be, if I'm a good librarian, I'm invisible. If I do my job well, you never notice, right? Oh, it was so easy to find that book. Oh, it was so in easy to find mm -hmm. this, et cetera. But we have to realize that as we're moving into the 21st century, as we're moving forward, and this sounds terribly academic, but I apologize. But the notion of agency, that is the thing that makes something happen, is moving from institutions to individuals. It is not a hospital that makes you well. Mm -hmm. It is your relationship with doctor and you taking care of your health. It is not a teacher that teaches someone. It is you as a learner who learns. 
Now, you need a good doctor and you need a good mm. teacher, but that's a relationship you have now. Mm. And the same thing with librarians. It's not that you have a good library that helped you learn. It has that you had a relationship with a librarian. Now, you may not be Very interpersonal. True. It could be how that librarian organized the room and organized the materials. In other words, oh. things that not directly talking to a person, mm. but it's a librarian that made those decisions. Mm -hmm. If you walk into a library and it's filled, stacks, top to bottom, and there's no place to sit or work with someone else, that was a decision of a librarian. Mm. Hopefully, because it matches how their community works. If you walk into a library, um, one librarian I talked to, Corinne Hill, who's the director of the uh, Chattanooga Public Library, brilliant library, was redoing all of their branch libraries when she was in Dallas, Texas. And I said, so how do you do it? And she said, well, it's easy. We put the people in the center and we put the collections on the outside like art. And some people got very upset by that because they, they thought was what she meant was it's decoration. Oh, the mm -hmm. art. Oh, that's just decoration. But people say that don't understand art. I mean, we're in Rome, so we have to talk art. <laughs> um, right? Art for, for since we started working on caves has been about education and learning mm -hmm. and teaching. And the idea was that we're having this discussion and we're working and go, I have an idea. And you can reach and bring it into mm -hmm. the conversation. You're bringing these mm -hmm. resources in. And so setting up that way of working was a decision mm -hmm. by a librarian. And so librarians are orchestrating and making this happen. And librarians increasingly are moving, instead of across the desk from the people mm -hmm. they're, they're serving, they're moving side by side and learning together. That means when we educate librarians mm. and prepare librarians, yes, how do we organize information? How do we acquire information? Basic technology skills. But we also need cultural skills, mm. interpersonal skills. And one of the most important new skills is for us to understand that a library, no matter how small, no matter how grand, no matter where it is, changes the community that it is a part of. It could be as simple as they take tax dollars, so there's fewer tax dollars to spend on the roads. We hope it's, they're adding more value. Hopefully it is more than simply, oh, we have a library and it's over there. Mm -hmm. And that means that librarians need to learn, be prepared for, and understand that they're part of something that in the Salzburg um, curriculum that came out of a group uh, a couple of years ago, they called transformative social engagement. Hmm. Is that available online? It is. If you simply search the Salzburg curriculum, you will find that okay. online. Okay, great. And um, it talks about values and missions and topics. But transformative social engagement is the idea that your community, whether that community is a law firm, a hospital, a university, a government, a town, a, a country, a state, mm -hmm. should make the community that you're a part of better, mm. more educated, more able, more apt, more engaged, more worldly, whatever it is that that community and the librarian can come to a conclusion, where libraries make things, pardon me, librarians <laughs> make things better. We engage in change. Mm. And that is a new skill for many librarians. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Is that um, which kind of leads into my next question, uh, or one of my questions about library school curricula? Mm -hmm. um, how, what do they look like today in most um, universities in the United States, and how are they designed? How, how do they keep up to date with, with the concepts that you're talking about? So in the United States, um, we have an accrediting body called the American Library Association. Mm -hmm. they are, it's a membership organization, and so in essence, the profession certifies, qualifies, um, accredits these programs happens on a seven-year basis. Sometimes if there are issues, it will happen sooner. And so that's the first thing. They have a series of standards, and the standards are everything from um, how, how your students come in, what's your faculty mm -hmm. like, and what do your faculty know. But a lot of the standards go around the idea of how do you engage the profession, and how do you engage your students, and how do you engage potential employers. Are those standards available on ALA's website? They are. Once again, if you search ALA accreditation standards, you will find a huge amount of information because we're all paranoid about getting that accreditation. <laughs> um, what, that, what those standards don't do is they don't say you teach this class and that class and that class and that class. So it's up to each program to determine what its specific curriculum mm -hmm. is, to demonstrate that they have a curriculum, they built it with input from the profession, and they have ongoing evaluation to make sure it's constantly serving 
and keeping up to date with the profession. Um, so those curricula can look very different. Um, there is some curriculum at a school where it's completely sort of up to the student. They come in, they meet with their advisor, and they determine a program of study. Our curriculum at Syracuse, half of it is what we call a core curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's the skills, techniques, knowledge, and learning we feel are essential to all librarians. And then half of their curriculum is uh, specializing in whether it's technology or public libraries or school librarianship mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, and so the curriculum across these different programs can look very different. But, once again, because we have this accreditation process, because they're supposed to be listening to their communities, mm -hmm. There is a sense that those will evolve over time, um, but once again, the mechanism is different. Um, for example, at Syracuse, we develop it within our program, we approve it within our school, the university approves it, and then the state approves it. Oh. So, you know, each one's slightly different in mm -hmm. how they go through it. And these are master's level courses, correct? In the United States, the, the, the library science degree is at the master's level. It's mm -hmm. considered a terminal degree, meaning the highest degree in librarianship. There are people who get PhDs, but they mm -hmm. tend to be in information science or other areas. Um, and yes, that's how it works. We do not have a bachelor's, there are, I think, a few renegade bachelor mm -hmm. programs out there, but many states um, have regulation and laws that say that you must have a master's of library science from an accredited program. Mm -hmm. Now, in the example of Syracuse, um, what made you take the word library out of that and, and make it the I school? Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. So, it's a long story, but it's, I'll make it <laughs> we, as, we've got, yeah, we got time. Well, we have some other questions all right, here, so too. I, I, all right. The short answer is, as early as the 1970s, we had a dean by the name of Bob Taylor, brilliant man, wrote one of the greatest articles in library science ever on question negotiation. Um, but, oh yes, everyone knows Taylor 68. But anyway, and he really saw the idea that Increasingly, the skills areas that we were investigation research we were doing for libraries were becoming more and more useful in other domains. So they were becoming useful in banking. That would suddenly they said, "Yes, we are in the money business, but really we're about moving data about money around." And you look at even something like the transportation field, and you say, "Oh, it's asphalt. What's this have to do?" Well, these days they're embedding sensors into the asphalt so that in the winter, if the roads freeze over, it says, come salt me, because salt is corrosive to the environment. So if they can use the sensors and not just salt everything, they can lower environmental impacts. That's information. Um, and so Taylor and, and his colleagues saw this coming. And so that was, we were the first information school where we went from the School of Library Science to the School of Information Studies. And the studies, I think, is an important word because it was an acknowledgement on the faculty that said, it's not quite a science yet. We're still figuring this out. Um, that was certainly joined by other um, library science programs, either by merging multiple programs together or them seeing this broader opportunity. Um, and that's worked pretty well because, um, unfortunately, many industries don't realize they want to hire librarians. And so they go hire information specialist, even though, you know, we know the truth. Um, over time, however, as we've added undergraduate degrees, as we've added additional programs, we've begun to sort of have a tension now between the core values of service and principles of librarianship mm -hmm. and the technology and data focus of the True. information world. True. And we, but we, we need each other. Librarians need technology and data to go out and be of great service mm -hmm. to their community. And we know technologists need ethics and values and a service orientation to best meet their community mm -hmm. needs. Um, we need more librarians in industries and governments where it's not just about can I find this data or how do I build the software, but is this ethical? What mm -hmm. about privacy? Mm -hmm. what, what, what should we do and what shouldn't we do? Mm -hmm. And I think that librarianship still gives a soul to the information programs and the information schools. I would agree with you. And I, I usually think of it as the user-focused kind of education mm -hmm. that, um, that I think we need. But um, is enrollment in uh, information library, whatever you want to call it, programs in the United States, is it increasing or decreasing these days? To it your, is to your knowledge. It is the word we would use is rebounding. Um, oh, so good. yeah, we had a we had a pretty historical high before the economic crisis. Mm. And the great thing about libraries is that there are academic libraries and there are public libraries. And so in the United States, what happened was 
first of all, most state budgets and, and local budgets were a year behind. So when the economic crisis hit everyone in the pocketbook, libraries had about a year buffer before they had to worry about it. But then... So that would have been about 2009. 2009, and we saw, began to see layoffs of, of public libraries. Mm -hmm. At the same time, however, many people who lose their job go back to work or go back to school. Mm. And so our academic oh, libraries actually saw increased usage and increased need and increased That's enrollments. And so now we're getting to the point of sort of normalizing again. Mm. There was a dip, particularly unfortunately, in school libraries. Mm. But as I talked to many library science programs, we're finding this, it's not quite back to our historic highs, but it's, it's, it's come up. Okay. And so we still have a pretty healthy enrollment. And part of the value of an information science program is we have an information management degree. 90% of the students in that degree are um, students from abroad. We have a lot of students oh. from India and Asia, That's China, et cetera. Our library science program, 98% of it is U.S. and North American. So there's mm. a diversity that's occurred in the populations, which one, cultural diversity is great because it helps mm, us definitely. talk across that, but also sort of an economic diversity of different populations. Sure. Um, what is your opinion of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses for LIS Education? Um, I, I offered one. I did. I, we had 2,300 students come through a program. That's great. That's it is great. Um, it was fun. We learned a lot. It was over about a month. I learned that I tried to compress a semester's worth of course into a month, so that's what I really learned. But um, I'm sure your students loved it. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, what, we found, what we've found and what I think lots of other people have found is that the idea that a MOOC would somehow replace the idea of a college degree or the value of going, whether online or in person, to small classes and focus mm -hmm. classes, that's not realistic. What we've found MOOCs to be really useful for is awareness and introduction to topics. Oh. So, for example, a course like mine, which was on librarianship writ large, mm -hmm. ideas, they can engage it, they can get it, they can dip in and out. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that historically we're finding as people are offering these is there's about a 10 to 13 percent completion rate. Wow. Now, in a tradition, if that were a traditional classroom, that is a failure. That is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. If I only got 13% of my students to graduate a class, I would not be teaching very long. Um, but in a MOOC environment, if you look at it as introduction and awareness, it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. someone comes in, they see the one thing they need, and they're out. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't stay to the end. Mm -hmm. That's fine. It's almost like auditing a class. That's exactly what it one. is. And it works really well mm -hmm. for auditing, awareness, mm -hmm. getting large issues out there. What we find is when you want to get mastery of a topic, when you want to get depth of a topic, mm -hmm. it still comes down to having a conversation amongst colleagues and peers and professors. And we as a human species have not figured out how to scale conversations past about 30 people um, where there are substantive contributions across mm -hmm. that. I mean, from the Greeks to today, we're still yeah. working on it. <laughs> well, actually, today I wanted to have a, a live web chat with our viewers out there. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have the techn technology support available for that. But I think that's a worthy goal, you know, in order to at least approach each other, you know, to that last three feet right. of engagement so yeah. that you can um, hopefully make it all the way and at I'm some point. And I'm on Twitter and I have email and you can find me so we can continue this. Um, all right. Uh, what are your suggestions for continuing education for librarians and information professionals? I think it's essential. Um, once again, if... The view of librarianship, if it's rooted very much in the artifacts and materials, we figure that out. Mm, definitely. <laughs> it, it, we, we have the idea of, you know, between ont ontological research, classification research, the idea of how you organize materials, house materials. We're getting very good at preservation. We're getting very good at mm. digitization. These kinds of traditional tasks of material handling are something where we really can take intensive training at the beginning of a career, and you're sort of refreshing on the job. There are areas such in digitization and metadata that we're mm -hmm. finding are actually pretty dramatically different and changing. When you begin looking at these as tools and that you're serving a community's learning needs, those tools change rapidly. True. Um, MOOCs you mentioned, we mm -hmm. talk about Twitter and Facebook, but even the tools of how publishing is happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, there was a time when you could say that publisher produces the good material and uh, as long as I buy all the material from that publisher I'm doing fine. But then that publisher is now under increasing economic stress from the sense that before they would 
work really hard to get a brilliant book, print 200,000 copies mm. of them, and work really hard to sell 200,000 copies. But because they printed 200,000 copies, they were cheap. Each one was cheap. Mm. So they had relatively high margins. Now, even normal traditional publishing, Amazon doesn't want to warehouse 200,000 items. So they mm. order 10,000 at a time, or 2,000 mm. at a time, or two at mm. a time, and they want on demand. That means the publisher has to go from their business model of lots cheap mm. to suddenly small and expensive. Mm. That means that publishing is changing, the number of issues they're putting out, the editorial control. Some people have said that that has led publishers to be get, become much more safe. They don't mm. really deal with many fringe topics. They, don't, they sort of find the winning formula and keep putting out the formula. There's a real worry in the humanities and in the notion of public scholarship that all the deep thinking doesn't show up in books anymore because it's all got to be the dummy's guide to this and it's all got to be sort of okay the the you know the Gladwell book sold more give us 12 more Gladwell mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. and so that means that that tool's changing and and what it's forcing is self publishing on the outside whole mm -hmm. new ways of publishing mm -hmm. I, I self publish sometimes it's blogs sometimes video sometimes mm -hmm. physical book and that means that even if you're the most traditional diehard, I only want print books in my, my library, you have to get up to speed on a whole new industry yeah. and technologies and self-publishing mm -hmm. and refresh your ideas. So continuing education no longer becomes an option. It's mandatory for every mm -hmm. librarian in every setting for every community. Mm -hmm. So how would you recommend that we, um, especially international librarians, um, that really don't have like the background of American Library Association or a Special Libraries Association um, to back that up. How can they seek out um, continuing professional development in their countries? We live in a sort of golden age of everyone's producing continuing education. And while there are still associations for a long time thought this is going to be a revenue generator, so mm -hmm. they're for fee and they, they sort of, right. that certainly diminishes access. But increasingly people are understanding that just like when we created all this electronic metadata for our databases, we originally thought that's the value. Mm. We cataloged it, we keep it, it's ours. Mm. And now we realize that the value of metadata is you give it away so that people can find your article, your mm. book, your material. Academics, librarians, they're all realizing the same thing, which is you give away online development. I do webcasts, I do a blog. Mm. Uh, many librarians are on Twitter. Mm. Um, Stephen Abrams is tweeting away on interesting links and documents. Associations are printing free materials and such. And so what I would recommend is if you want to keep up, that online education is really happening online. Um, YouTube is a hard way to find it. Twitter is actually an easier way to find really? continuing education. Huh. Uh, find some sort of library stars, see who they're following, and start following them. Who would you recommend? Um, like I say, Stephen Abrams does a great job in that he's sort he's of, good. I consider him the pointer of our profession. He, he finds interesting things and points to them. Um, in school librarianship, Buffy Hamilton does oh, an amazing job around literacy. Jasmine West publishes great information around sort of the ethics and the soul of the profession, so I keep up with her. Um, you, you, I'm going to, uh, Steve. Um, it's almost like I the know, Academy they, Awards. Everyone's going to be who watching. Yeah, right, everyone's going to be watching. <laughs> Steve Thomas does a, a podcast on circulating ideas where he has mm. lots of really great thinkers mm. and he spends an hour with them. Um, so it's a matter of, you know, if you start there and see who they're following mm. and see who they're retweeting, okay. Now, Twitter is a dangerous place. Um, it can be a rather brutal place. Mm. Um, and I think the more librarians there to help make it a civil and civic conversation, the better. Um, so Facebook has Facebook groups um, from the ALA think tank to, mm. once again, following individuals. Um, that's sort of where you find them. The biggest issue that we are needing to confront in sort of the next phase of this is not, is there enough continuing education? But how does it fit together? Mm. You know, good point. Yeah, you know, what do what mm -hmm. are the competencies that librarians need, and then how can I take those large scale competencies and make all right in my local setting that's this and this and this, mm -hmm. and if I take this online course, it meets these criteria. So we're going to need to have a better infrastructure so that as librarians constantly renew their knowledge, mm -hmm. they're able to create, in essence, a portable transcript. So as they move from environment and country to country, library to library, they can mm -hmm. say, this is what I know.
This mm. is what I've, my experience is. This mm -hmm. is my understanding. Okay, those are good ideas. What, um, uh, what is your familiarity with the conferences and the materials that IFLA offers? Because I think they're quite good. Oh, absolutely. IFLA does a fantastic job, and I love some of their de declarations. Mm. They do really good. Um, they do. They do really good materials for continuing education and identifying some of the topics. One of the things that IFLA and just about every library association is going to have to confront is moving from creating standards and declarations to actually creating networks and infrastructure to support librarians working together. Uh, I'm fascinated by the international mentoring program where you can go online and say, I am a librarian, I am in Namibia, I need some help. And they'll say, here's a librarian, in, it's library director in Sweden. And oh. connect you and you can begin having conversations So you can just Google international mentoring? And, Inter and international it. librarian mentoring. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm that. not getting the title, but I can send them in. But yes, so those kind of networks Great. are becoming more important than the documents that these mm. library associations produce. Okay, that's great. I was unaware of that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, to move on with some of the questions that some of yes. our um, viewers um, have submitted, uh, this one comes from a colleague uh, at the U.S. Embassy um, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And despite all the professional training and highlights about librarians and librarianship, organizations that are considering downsizing or right-sizing look at their libraries and the resources there as the first place to cut mm -hmm. human and other kind of resources. How can we overcome this approach within the scope of today's syllabus and training in library and information science, and I would add, on the job itself. Sure. The first is to realize that the thing that we need to protect most are the librarians. And I don't mean that in a, in a sort of protectivist, keep my job, mm -hmm. LIS education, education. I mean that when you look at the, uh, you're going to need to look at impact, right? When we're going to begin to downsize or cut things, we want to know those things that aren't adding value to the bottom line or to the mission of the institution or to... Uh, the community's well-being. And that's all impact, and that's all human to human. So having strong relationships with the decision makers, we need that not simply to save our job, but once again, we have values and ethics that we would like to get ingrained in. Everything from a diplomatic mission where we mm. talk about openness and transparency, and we talk about learning, and we talk about service, to banks where we talk about equitable access and privacy and to startup companies in Silicon Valley where we talk about the ethical use of data and um, what disclosures. So we need to have those relationships mm -hmm. with the decision makers and those are human to human relationships. It's never my library to human relationship. So we need to have those connections and that means that more than ever we as librarians need to get outside of our libraries. We need to understand that the library is owned by the community, not the librarian. Mm -hmm. So in this, you know, the information center here in the embassy is, a, is owned by the embassy, which is ultimately owned by me as a citizen, um, and that the librarian may work there. But more than that, that's a space, yeah, may house collections, may house tools, may house materials for the community to come in and participate mm -hmm. in. Librarians should be busy out on the streets, out on the roads, out making connections with that community to find out what they're talking about, how to serve it. So mm -hmm. what is the impact that I have personally? Is that impact understood by decision makers personally? Mm -hmm. Am I out in that community, community of business, community of lawyers, community of the university, out there making a difference, and the space and tools that I provide, books, materials, databases, physical spaces, et cetera, are those aligned to the desires and aspirations, aspirations mm -hmm. of your community? Mm -hmm. All too often, particularly in public libraries, we spend a lot of time worrying about what people can't do. Oh, we have low literacy mm -hmm. rates. Oh, our economic development is horrible. Oh, we don't have tourism. It's all about problems. If you've ever had a friend who spends a lot of time pointing out your problems, you usually don't have that friend for long, right? That's a lovely dress on someone else, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sure you'd be great in that job even though you're unqualified, right? This, but what mm. do we do to our communities? Mm. Oh, we have a reading problem. Mm. Oh, we have an internet access problem. Oh, we keep pointing out what's wrong. Mm. What if we said, oh, if we had a literate community that was reading and writing and engaged in the world, wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, we better work on reading. 
It's a very different message. Oh, we have brokers, stockbrokers that are making poor economic decisions. If they understood the information sources available to them for those decisions, they would do a better job. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Justice, one of their divisions is around economics. They make mm -hmm. the antitrust decisions in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I visited their economics library. It's open 24 hours a day, but not with librarians. The librarians get to go home and go to sleep. Because the economists know that library collection so well, they hmm. come back in the middle of the night. They all work at night, and they, they physically physically uh, yeah, enter yeah. the building. Yes, they that's come interesting. In, and they shelve the books for the librarian. The librarian doesn't even know where the book because they know that collection better than the librarian. So the librarian that's impressive is busy not teaching the economists economics, mm -hmm. not giving them the economy books that they know and want to tell. They tell the librarian, go buy this. Go buy. Mm. They're spending the time going, the economist saying, I have an antitrust decision in the cable industry. I need to know about the cable industry. Mm. And then the librarian mm -hmm. and their research skills, they're out and they're talking and they're looking mm. in different libraries and they come back to the economist. And so they're helping the economist do their job, not organizing the material that may help them do their mm. job. So being out there, being engaged with the community directly. Get out of the building, get out of the building. Yeah, the building belongs to the community, get them in, get you out. So. Or get out of your cubicle, oh, as, as the case may be. That's correct. All right, our next question comes from, um, from Brazil, and it says that library and information science education should for sure be taught side by side with social sciences and education. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree. Okay. Um, let's see, that would uh, broaden the horizons of the students mm -hmm. and presumably the faculty and make them understand that they have a role in education and civil society. Yes. Okay. So, um, so um, let's see, and then the actual question is, do you think that one way to do that would be by making them understand that they would be a kind of mentor for younger generations? Um, so first of all, greetings to my friends in Brazil. Um, one of my books called Expect More is currently being translated into Portuguese and will be released here at the end of the month. Unfortunately, I'll be in an airplane as they're having their conference. And what's the title again? Expect More. Okay, um, Thank you. Uh, Demanding Better Libraries for Today's Complex World. I don't know what it is in Portuguese. Um, I think absolutely we need to, first of all, librarianship has always been interdisciplinary. Um, if you're in an academic mm. world, sometimes we talk about transdisciplinary. That is, hmm. the science that we have, the expertise that we have, the skills that we develop, the research that we do, has applicability in the sciences, in the humanities, in anthropology, etc. But increasingly those skills, ontology development, information organization, information retrieval, are being informed by the idea that we want to have impact. Mm. So it's not enough to say I've made a beautiful collection. You have to say I've made a beautiful collection for this purpose. And what is that purpose? That purpose is learning, right? We've always been about learning. Mm. We built the Library of Alexandria, was the world's first startup. It wasn't about the scrolls. They were in the musee, the museum. It was the scholars that mm. were in the library and the librarian was the closest advisor to the mm. kings and queens. We know that that this idea that we're about knowledge and learning, it's always been fundamental. We've just become so enmeshed with the tools and the complexity of the tools and the power of the tools mm. that we've forgotten it's all about learning and mm. education. Mm. This is somewhere back to our information science conversation. Exactly. right? We feel like we can throw computing and code at everything and it will solve mm. a problem. Mm -hmm. We think if we can get internet access through you know, the, the most remote areas of Australia, then the Australian society will thrive. Never mind that they need great transportation, they need civic engagement and mm -hmm. rights, they need whole civil, I mean, it's a complex mm -hmm. problem. We can't just solve it with technology. Learning and improving knowledge of a society is a complex problem that we can't solve with the magic book. We have to understand that that book means something, it's interpreted, it's understood. There's a, a wonderful, wonderful librarian, Betsy Kennedy in Casanova Library, and she realized that there was a, during the economic downturn, they had a food pantry. Mm -hmm. And the parents would come in for the food, and they would bring their children, and their children were bored and, not, and had no great access to education. She started a reading program. Mm -hmm. 
And then she realized as she was working with the children, helping them with literacy, that the parents were having trouble finding jobs because they had literacy problems. Mm. So they began a high school equivalency program. And then they realized that this is just one food pantry, so they worked with churches and they built throughout the county mm -hmm. systems like this. But she tells the story of they would give out books and they'd get new books donated and, and she was giving it out to one young girl and the young girl began to cry when she took the book. Mm -hmm. And Betsy said, what's wrong? And the girl said, this is the first new thing I have ever owned in my life. Yeah. Oh. That's librarianship, mm. not because it was a book, but because what that girl needed was a sense of self, mm. was recognition. And what we as librarians can bring to our communities, can bring to our universities, can bring to the poor, the homeless, as well as the educated and the suburbanite and the parent, is we can bring a sense of meaning into mm. their life. Mm -hmm. And that may come from a book, but it may come from a 3D printer. Mm. It mm -hmm. may come from talking in a human library to a doctor or a musician or helping someone start a business. Mm -hmm. But that's our goal, mm -hmm. to make the community better. Not to collect what the community produces. Mm -hmm. That's great, mm -hmm. but only if it can go back into and mm -hmm. generate new ideas and new creations. Almost new like mentoring. Absolutely. You know, as, as our um, colleague in Brazil points out. That's yeah. very well put, yes. Actually. Thank you, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. And then we have some questions here from Italy oh, um, in our remaining time. Uh, what do you think was the role for libraries and librarians during social movements like the Arab Spring mm. or in economic crises like now in Greece? So I, I think that this is where education is important. I think that if we are going to, as societies, as countries, as nations, but also in larger society, Discuss democracy with any fidelity. Discuss the notion of democratic access and participation with any sort of integrity. That means that everyone within the community must be active and a, and a member of that. We, to, to, we must rule ourselves. And now, I, I saw a tweet somewhere saying, Lankis says that people, for democracy, people must be informed. And I said, I stole that from Thomas Jefferson. So <laughs> there's a little founding fathers going, there's a lot of founding fathers going into that statement. But that means that as librarians, if ultimately it's about learning, why are we learning? We're learning so that we can govern ourselves. We're learning so that we can provide a better society today and tomorrow for our children, for ourselves, for economic development. So when you see economic crises or political crises or even just civic crises, mm -hmm. libraries are there. What we have seen in, we've seen in, in the Hurricane Sandy taking out huge parts of the East Coast. Mm. When families and homes were destroyed, the libraries opened. Even when the librarians' homes were destroyed, they went to the library, they opened the mm. door, it became the place they could charge their phone and find out if their relatives were still mm. alive. We see in, um, when protests turn to riots, we see libraries open to make available to their community going, no, we're still a family, it's still about learning. We see, I was asked during, say, the Charlie Hebdo um, mm. shootings, what can libraries do? They can bring a community together to say, look, this is a new immigrant, this is someone who's lived here for hundreds mm. of years, this is this religion, this is this perspective, but we live together, we're a community, what does it mean? And provide a safe place to have a conversation mm about what it means to be a community. When you have an entire country making referendum decisions about their future and their children's future, mm. we better be informed about what that vote means. Many times librarians say, oh, it's political, I can't be involved in politics. And yet, this is the most important decisions we can make. Mm. So we must know our history, we must know our current topics, we must have multiple viewpoints, and we must have a place, conceptually or physically, that a community can come together and outside of the burden of commerce, outside of the, the, the burden of family or religion or what have you, but can come together as the community place and say, what do we think about this? Mm -hmm. The piazza in Italy, the mm -hmm. piazza in, in Spain, they're closing. The, 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 mm -hmm. the benches are going away. The, the commercial areas are getting bigger and bigger. They're being redeveloped. The new piazza, the new, for my Greek friends, the new agora, mm. 
is the library. And even in academic settings, if you're in a university and you say, oh, I'm a physicist, and I don't talk to you because you're a biologist, mm -hmm. and oh my goodness, those, those historians over there, they can come together in the academic library mm -hmm. and they can realize that physics and chemistry and history mm -hmm. all intermingle together. Yeah, that's what I like about the information commons concept. Yes. You know, that I know a lot, of, a lot of academic institutions and libraries in the states are adopting because it does create that piazza agora um, opportunities for conversation and creating knowledge together. I like that concept a lot. But you mentioned immigration and immigrants, and that leads into our next question, which is how do you think libraries can help with the integration of immigrants? And how can a topic like this be integrated itself mm -hmm. into the LIST curriculum? So there, there's a couple of issues there. One is a cultural, his, a cultural heritage issue. I think too many folks look at cultural heritage as the artifacts that came from the past. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at something like the UNESCO definition of cultural heritage, they define it as places and monuments, um, things. And yet our cultural heritage is the conversations we have, the values that our parents mm -hmm. taught us, the, the, you know, I mentioned our founding fathers. You mm -hmm. know, those words, it's not simply that we have a document with those words, it's those words being taught and lessons and all of this. And so when we look at an immigrant population, part of what we need to help those immigrants do is not to become us, but to enrich that cultural conversation. And, and to enrich a conversation means mm -hmm. you must understand the conversation, whether it's in a given language, whether it has certain references to the past, whether it has whatever it is, mm -hmm. and frankly, challenge it. That because what we as librarians have always said, I mean, if you go back to 1932, the American Library Association put out our statement of ethics. And it says, we as librarians bring a diversity of viewpoints to any issue. Rather than saying this is the one answer, we say, look, mm -hmm. this is the answer that science provides. Mm -hmm. But there are other views. This is the mainstream answer, but there are other views. So diversity, we know that's how you do good service. Mm -hmm. And so having more diverse voices, having more diverse opinions, having more diverse backgrounds, it's essential. And so we should be engaged deeply within the immigrant population to help them become part of our national conversation. Um, and that means they must feel wanted. Mm -hmm. They must feel valued. They must understand the norms of that conversation, but they must also feel empowered to have their own norms and say, wait, mm -hmm. what about this? Mm -hmm. In the United States, we, in the past six months, have had an amazing national conversation, which I hope is a start and continues, around issues as diverse of same-sex marriage, uh, as issues as diverse of racial identity, of white privilege, of uh, heritage, of Southern history, and so Libraries can be part of that conversation so we don't feel like we have to fight about them, but we can come together and we can have civic and civil mm -hmm. conversations. And facilitate that conversation. Exactly. Right. As a librarian, we should have every role to say, we respect your opinion, we respect your view, but we also respect theirs, mm -hmm. and so we now need to make sure that we're going to have an equal conversation there. Right. One thing that I've noticed um, working in U.S. public libraries with the immigrant community is that sometimes they don't even know that the library exists. Yeah. So do you have any suggestions or views from your colleagues in the States on how they can address that? Absolutely. I mean, if you're coming from cultures or countries or even regions without strong library service, mm. it's natural not to know what they are. Mm. Or in sometimes you have a strong sense of library, but it's around cultural heritage or materials. And so understanding that this can be a place of learning and such is new. The quick answer to that is to get out of the library, to mm -hmm. go to mm -hmm. where they, they congregate. In, Illinois, they're starting what they call hotspot loaner programs, and, and they do this in New York and Chicago and such, which is, in the United States, the internet's increasingly important, so in schools, you have access to all these wonderful electronic resources, you go home, you have no internet connection, mm. you can't do it. So they're loaning little cell phone yeah. hotspots that turn, that create a wireless network in your home. What the, this library program is doing is fantastic is, they're loaning them out to homes, but the way they're making people know it is they're going to soccer games, sorry, football games. They're going to athletic events. They're going to the street fairs. They're going to ah. the street markets. Mm. And they set up a table, and the table isn't about two people sitting there going high in the library. 
It's, do you need access to the internet? Come here. Mm -hmm. Oh, while you're here, mm -hmm. by the way, did you know we do this and this and this? It's, it's kind of like, you know, offering refreshments and while they're drinking, you're going, that's a great water. Would you like more? We have some right over here. It's called a public library. And while you're there, <laughs> and so it mm. comes back to being outside of the community. Mm. Um, libraries are taking their old bookmobiles, tearing out the books and putting them with online access stations. Not because mm. the books are unimportant, mm. but because getting connection is more important. Mm. Um, they're working with local governments to set up bus lines because one of the greatest okay. barriers to library service is transportation. How am I going to get a better job unless I can learn? Mm. And how am I going to learn unless I can get to a library mm. or university and I can't afford the car? So, mm. so libraries are finding working in partnerships with museums and hospitals and bus lines mm. and taxi services oh, and telecommunications to make it happen. Go librarians. Yes. All right. Um, our last question, I think, is, um, is a really good one. And, um, and it begins with, what is your impression of the Italian libraries you have seen? And what is your impression of the list education situation or um, status outside the US? I have seen some amazing physical libraries. I have met some brilliant librarians. I will be honest that the general impression that I get is that there is a great concern among Italian librarians. There is a great frustration among Italian librarians. I think they hear about and see all these wonderful services and such, and they say, well, we feel like we're closed in. We're closed in by our, our faculty. We're closed mm -hmm. in by bureaucracy. We don't have enough money. So there's a tension here. Mm -hmm. And that tension can easily, unfortunately, turn to despair. But I think that tension can very easily turn into action. A mobility and a social action where we begin to connect those who want to push libraries forward. So that if you have a bad day, you can talk to someone across the way, back to our mentoring program. Mm -hmm. I think there are fantastic opportunities with not only the cultural heritage, tradition, and materials, but amazing people who look at history and can bring in. You have the most amazing invitations in Italy ever to the world scholars to come in and talk mm -hmm. amongst themselves and with you, and what a great place to learn. So I see great opportunity. I would say that in terms of LIS education, I would say it's not unique to Italy. I see some in the United States. I've seen in other countries. There is a great focus on materials. There's a great mm. focus on the philosophy and organization, not enough necessarily experimentation. Just please realize that the, the fear that a librarian feels from stepping out from behind the desk and sitting next to and learning with a patron or a member or a customer or a user is probably half of what a professor feels from realizing they have to learn mm. from their own students. That when students ask you a question, instead of giving them an answer, you have to realize going, I don't know, let's find out together. And that can it would be difficult. That to is do. difficult, and that is a cultural shift that all gray bearded mm. professors and are, are having to deal with. And um, I see opportunities mm. there as well. I see Anna Maria Tamaro, I see wonderful in, in instructors in Italy that are mm. pushing for these kinds of changes and reform and they're networking around the world to make it mm. happen. I'm really impressed with the dedication that I've seen, not uh. only with Italian librarians, but with all the librarians that I've met in the course of my job. Um, so finally, last but not least, um, I really put you through the ringer today, I think. <laughs> um, what do you think are the big differences and similarities? I think we've already covered some of the similarities between American and European or international librarians. I think that, that what, one thing that's happening in Europe that I hear over and over again, I've heard it in the UK, I hear it in Italy, I hear it in, in many places is that we're dealing right now with a crisis. And it's an economic crisis, mm. but that economic crisis is quickly exposing a crisis of culture, of, of privilege, a culture of class, of different cultures, but it's being brought on by the notion of austerity budgets and what mm. can we afford. Many countries are now having to have very frank conversations about priorities. And some feel very dictated, to about mm. what those priorities are. In the United States, we went through an economic crisis as well. And what libraries, what, what, what pushed libraries of all sorts, school, academic, special, public, to embrace this community idea was the fact that they realized that one, their communities were hurting, and two, as a library, they could no longer stand by as their core value of service and say, well, if you need books, and if books will help you, or if the collections will help you, or the space will help you, then we'll be here. 
They said, no, 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 we have to go out. What do they need? They need job training. They need help in resumes. They need to go back into education. They need, the library shifted and said, they're us mm -hmm. and we hurt. And how can we help that? And so as we've seen a gradual but real improvement in the economy in the U.S., as the communities have gotten better, they've realized that they've re been reintroduced to their libraries. They've realized the value that those libraries can support, both in traditional and new services. And so they begin to say, how can I support that? Mm -hmm. now, now we have more taxes, more taxes to go here. Now I have enough money to spend in tuition. I want to make sure I have a good library when I'm selecting. They, that by embracing our communities in the hardest and toughest of times, those communities remember, and as they rebound, they bring with them the libraries because they're the community. I mean, I keep saying this over and over again. Why does a librarian want to, to change their library for the better? Because they want to work in a place that's good to work in. Why do they want to change their, why do they want their public library to be a good public library? Because they want a good place to live in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very selfish drive that leads to improvement, which is I want my neighbor to do well, I want to do well, and I know libraries can be part of that. And so what I would say is in LIS education and in all education, we are catching up to say we need to equip librarians to be activists. Mm. We I need, agree. yeah, we I need agree. librarians. What other, you know, someone say, oh, well, well, the communities, if libraries say we're going to be this and we're going to help, me, will communities accept it? And I said, if you had someone come up and said, I'm from a profession for, with 4,000 years of history dedicated to knowledge and has an ethical concern that's grounded in hundreds of years of tradition and have current and modern skills that can help you in your life. Are you going to say no? You know, but to do that, we have to embrace as librarians, whether you were educated in the school, whether you were educated on the job, whether you simply were given the job, we have to embrace that we have that power mm -hmm. and that value. That when people come up to us and we say we're librarians, we shouldn't say, oh, we're librarians. And we shouldn't be embarrassed by it. And, and if they say back to us, oh, librarians, that's nice, but you're pretty obsolete, that's an opportunity for us to have a three-hour long conversation about how they're wrong. <laughs> or one hour, yeah, which, could, which could go on, as, go. as the case may be. <laughs> but thank you so much for being so patient with all of our questions. And, um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation ah, and off me as camera. Well. <laughs> Absolutely. And please, um, Twitter, email, my website, please. I love, this is, this is how I learn, is by having these conversations. Yeah, me so. too. All right. Thank you so much, David. It was, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.